Yo, what up, everybody? Cameron Van Hoy here. Thanks for coming by. Great to see you all again. I want to talk about editing today because it's such an important process. You know, it's it's like a lot of people say that a movie is made in the editing room, and that's true to an extent. I mean, it, you know, it's made it's made three times really. A movie's made when you write it, it's made when you shoot it, and it's made when you edit it, right? And every time you want to have like a fresh perspective, you know, you want to be able to throw away all of your ideas from the previous iteration. You want to be able to start fresh and really like bring new eyes to it and try to tell the story in a different way or find new things within it. But at the same time, like kind of stay true to what you're doing. But then at the same time, find what it is that you're doing because you're always finding what you're doing. I think even when you're editing, you're still finding what the movie is, right? So editing specifically, you know, it's a big deal because you make or break a movie in the editing room. That's without question. You, you know, you can turn not great scenes into really good scenes and you can turn really good scenes into great scenes in the editing room. And the weird thing about editing for me is that it's infinite. There are infinite possibilities, infinite directions. I always look at editing as like you're out in the middle of the ocean and you there's no land anywhere around you, right? Everywhere you look, there's no land, there's no land, there's no land. So it's like, well, where do I paddle? You know, like which way do I go with any given scene? You know, because imagine like, let's say you have a scene, you have two characters, two shots and they're talking to each other. Then maybe you have like a wide shot, then you have like an overhead shot of the table and maybe some other shots, right? Whatever you have for the scene. Well, it's, you know, if that's a four page scene, I mean, like it's infinite. Who do you start on? Who do you cut to? Which is your favorite moment? And then of course you're going to come into problems like, okay, this moment is not matching with this moment. There's a motion here that's not happening here and I can't cut from there to there and I need to get out of this. So what do I do? And then sometimes you're compromising, right? You're like, okay, well, I can't use my favorite moment here because it's not allowing the scene to complete here. And then like the more complex a scene becomes, the more difficult that is, you know? And then suddenly like, that, and that's, of course, that's continuity. Like a lot of that is continuity. And this is where a lot of people talk about shooting to edit and being a director and a filmmaker who shoots to edit. And a lot of times people say that some of the better directors are directors who shoot to edit. And I will just make this point that, look, directors come from many walks of life. There are many types of creative people that end up directing movies. Actors often do it and they often do it really well because they know other actors and that really helps. Um, writers often do it. You know, they go from writing to directing and many times they do a really good job of going from writing to writing because they know story. And then they're able to really tell their stories well. You know, and there's all different types of directors. There's story-focused directors, performance-driven directors, visual world builders, all kinds of different things, you know, Co comedic directors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, editors become really good directors. A lot of editors that go on to become directors because again, they're, they're really, they know, they, they end up knowing performance. They end up knowing story really well. They end up knowing just movies, right? And how to really tell a movie. And lots of times the, the one kind of big position in the filmmaking process that I don't know too many stories of people who go from that job to being directors. I mean, I guess there's two, but one I understand why more than the other is the cinematographer. Cinematographers, there's not a lot of great cinematographers who have become directors. And it's like very strange. We could analyze why uh, many times they're so focused on the visual aesthetic and people think that that's what a movie is. A lot of people think, but it's really not. And in many ways, it's, I don't want to say that it's, it's not, it's not the least important piece of the puzzle. I don't know. It's really weird. Like sound is super important. I've always said you could shoot a movie that looks like garbage but you need great sound. People will not forgive bad sound. It's unwatchable. You could shoot something on your iPhone, really rough, cut it together. If you have great performances and it's an engaging story and it's fresh and the sound is good, it'll be great. If the sound's garbage, you're going to lose everybody. Sound is like so important, right? Performances, really important. Um, 
you need good performances. Bad performances are just cringe. When, when someone's on screen, and that doesn't mean they have to be great actors. There are certain films and filmmakers that get away with using non-actors in really creative ways. And you can kind of sense it, but it still works. So that's a talent in directing and also like a specific type of film that, that generally works within. But man, a bad actor to me, it's cringe. You can't watch it. You close your eyes. I, I literally close my eyes. When there's bad acting, I just, I'm like this. I can't, you know, it's, it's so hard to look at it. Uh, bad storytelling on many levels. One, it's just boring, formulaic. We've seen it before, not engaging, not deep. Characters aren't well-developed. It's all predictable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then also there's another piece of storytelling which has nothing to do with the script, but it's like the way the director tells the story visually, tonally, and aesthetically, which is like a really hard thing to discuss because it's so nuanced. Um, but that as well can also just, if it's done poorly, you're just like, uh, you know, it's uh, it's not original. In fact, a lot of the times I feel this way when I watch movies that feel like television, there's this standard in shooting a movie now. And it, it's really in TV, they do it a lot because you got to get through your days. Close up, close up master, right? And it's just boom, 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 all the way through a movie. And you know, if you're watching a movie and the whole thing is close up and masters at a certain point, you're just like, yo, this is not creative. And some of the great filmmakers, all the great filmmakers, they use their shots and their pace and their editing to tell this story and to create mood and to create cinema. Cinema is more than just the motion picture. It's the way it makes you feel. There's sets, you know, cinema. Cinema is all the things coming together and creating an emotion or a mood or, or something, you know, that you feel. To me, that's cinema. And so speaking with the language of cinema is really important. Um, so back to editing. Editors oftentimes make really good directors because they have, you know, they have the ability to pinpoint a good performance. They have the understanding of communicating story and ideas and emotions and nuance and feeling to an audience. Because many times the subtext is you know, the subtext isn't written in the script, right? It's not in the scene. So you got to be pretty astute to understand emotional pacing and subtext and these things and let them come out within a scene and really build towards them. Um, but yeah, so one of the big things that I've always found an issue with editing is like, where do you go? Cause it's, it's really infinite. You know what I mean? Like it is such an infinite thing. You can go, you can make infinite possibilities. So you got to let the story guide you. That's first, that's for sure. You know, like you have to try to let the story guide you. And this is where themes become very important. It's understanding the story that you're trying to tell. What is the movie that I'm trying to make? What am I trying to say here? What am I trying to do? And then that oftentimes can kind of, um, can kind of set the, the goalposts for everything else, for the mood, the tone, the feel, the style, um, and, and then you can kind of like build from there, you know? So you have like, like the story can give you that first general direction, then a real good understanding of who the characters are, you know? Um, and then of course, like understanding film history and movies in general and trying to do something a little different, right? Trying to approach a scene in a different way than it's done before, than it's been done before can really help you also to make some decisions because you're going to weed out a lot of the typical choices, right? Like as an example, one of the typical choices back to the most basic of setups, right? The over the shoulders and the master. Um, it's a very standard start in the master, go to this character, go to that character, right? Start here. Boom, boom. Start in the master. Boom, boom. Start wide, start in the master. Let them talk a little bit, go into one, go into the other. Okay. Move on. Right. We've seen that a million times. Why not start close, close, then come out to the master at the right moment. What is the right moment? Well, the scene will determine that, but you know, if you're, if you're understanding the story and the character and the narrative thread and the emotional thread and the tone, all these things, you can find the right placement to switch things up and to do things a little differently. One great scene to think about in the way of like shooting and then editing is in Michael Mann's Inside Man, the film with Russell Crowe. Uh, I think, well, who was that? Was that also Al Pacino in that? I can't remember. I think so. Um, about like the cigarette companies and that whole thing. Um, there's this one great scene. I think it's Crow and Al. There have, you know, there's like a scene. It's, you know, Michael Mann does the over the shoulder thing and he does it well because he shoots it 
you know, well, I'm a big fan of the way he used to shoot things. He got a little too digital for me, my, my personal tastes to later on, but like, man, heat and that whole era, Ali inside man, like that whole moment in time for him to me was, he was crushing visually and he was shooting very wide and like the back of, you know, when he's doing over the shoulder stuff, the back of a character's head is really holding like a large portion of the frame to where the character you're watching is oftentimes compressed between like the edge of the frame or maybe some darkness behind them here. And then the character's head here. So you're like stuck right on their face. And it's, it's such a classic cinematic look, you know, and then that's his over the shoulder. And then like his wides are always kind of well-placed many times like through a window or something else. And, and then of course, you know, he's, he's doing other things too, where it's not just one close up, but it's like a nice wide medium sort of tight medium, like maybe something really close on the face and deciding when and how to get closer is really great. And you can kind of cut back and forth and slowly move into the other characters versus pushing it, which is something Tarantino does a lot. A great example is the beginning of Pulp Fiction. Uh, I love you, honey, buddy. The scene in the diner, right? Well, if you look at the camera on both of them and like Pulp Fiction, when you watch it, it's a fairly traditionally shot film. It's, a, it's it, He doesn't get crazy. And I think it's because he knew he didn't have a lot of time and a lot of budget. And he made that movie for like $7 million or something. Incredible when you think about that story. But when you watch it, it's all pretty simple. Now, it still has style, right? It's not without style at all. It does have style. And he goes for it every once in a while, like the one following Bruce Willis from his car as he's breaking into Vince Vegas uh, or into his old place to get his watch where Vince Vegas hiding out. You go through that chain, which I still think that's an incredible shot. Just getting through that fence, whoever's operating that camera to get through that little hole in that fence, my God. And then going all the way into the apartment building. Um, But anyways, you know, he's pushing in. So when you watch a lot of his scenes, the camera is moving. So it's not slowly cutting back and forth and getting tighter. It's like, when you cut in, you're pushing in and you cut to this other character pushing in. So anyways, these are all different ways to like drive momentum and keep you engaged with what a character is saying and like switch it up a little bit visually. And it's energy, you know, it's like energy and stamina and pace and, and all of that stuff. But in Inside Man, when he's doing this between Russell and Al and he's getting closer with his cuts because he doesn't move the camera like that in those close-ups often or ever really. Um, there's this one moment when he breaks the line. Now, what's the line? The line, two characters are sitting at a table. These are their faces. They're looking at each other, right? There's a line between the two of them. The camera has to stay on one side or the other of that line at all times. You can't break it. It just messes with perspective for those watching, right? So if you have the two character, how do I do this? If you have character here and character here, right? These are the two characters, right? You got it. The camera can go anywhere here. If this is the line between them, if the camera starts here, on this guy, you're going to be here on this guy. You're not going to go here and then here on this guy, right? So, and the rule is whoever the first character, let, now let's say there's three characters. Oh, this gets complicated. Let's say there's three characters, right? Well, <laughs> which side, there's multiple lines here. There's line there, line here, line here. Who, so what determines the line? It's the opening of the scene, which character is talking to which other character first and, and how that's shot. So, That's a place where you actually have to think about editing because many times you don't know where you're going to begin a scene, right? Like let's say there's three people, especially if it's slightly improvisational at the beginning. Um, Anyways, the line, I don't want to get into it too much. There there should be another video on it, but um, let's say these two characters here are talking to each other first and we're on this guy here. Well, we're on this side of the line. So even when we're shooting this guy, it's always on this side. We're never coming over here to get him. I hope that with my fingers makes sense. And I'm sure many of you know this already, but for those of you who don't, the line is really important. Anyways, in Inside Man, he jumps the line deliberately. He jumps it deliberately. In this very important pivotal moment, it's like the kind of gotcha moment. And that was done to kind of jar you, right? And it's the type of jarring moment that an audience goer, they're not, they're not going to, you know, most of them are not going to go, oh, jump the line, right? Most people aren't going to do that, but it's subconsciously going to make you feel like something has changed. There's something different that's occurred. And that has been used as a device multiple times, both in shooting and editing, right? And that is just an example of like where you want to think 
ahead as a filmmaker with your editing cap on, right? Because you're making this movie in the editing and you're invoking emotion in editing. Um, Another really fun thing about editing is like placing music. I've always found placing music to be magical. You know, look, has anyone ever done the uh, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon played with The Wizard of Oz before? I did it when I was young, back in high school, you know, we were all smoking weed and thinking about movies and it was like, oh man, you got to do, you know, we were like discovering classic rock at this time, all the great classic rock bands like Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, and so many others and loving the music. And it's like, man, you know, that if you play this with dark side of the moon, with the wizard of Oz, it matches perfectly. Right. Like you start it right at the lion or like the third lion roar. And then yeah, there's all these wonderful moments, you know, like the tornado comes with that great song with the woman who's like, oh, you know, she's like singing operatic and it kind of feels like she's singing with the tornado. And then the song money starts right as she goes a little, uh, whatever you call them, the Oompa Loompa town and not Oompa Loompas, the, you know, the munchkins, you know, so right as it goes dark and then like the door opens and she goes into, which is the first time there's color, you know, like the song goes, but boom, 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 money, you know, and like comes out and it's color. And it, all these things feel as if it's planned. Now, I don't think it's planned. I think, in fact, they've even debunked this whole thing because the genius is, is if you ever take an editing software in any movie and start placing songs underneath, you're going to find patterns, right? That's what that's really a study in is the brain finds incredible patterns in cuts and moments with music, almost to the point of absolute magic. And it really is one of the magical moments uh, in the filmmaking process when you place great music under film and under cuts and you, and using like the the right cuts. In fact, most like, you know, needle drops are great opportunities for just like really powerful moments combined with a good cut, you know, and not to like riff off Michael Mann too much, but this latest show of his on HBO, the one with the Yakuza and the, the writer, what was that called? Uh, uh, Tokyo Vice. Great name. Great name. Um, there's this incredible needle drop where they play this like nineties classic, uh, till I come 9am till I come. And uh, it's like this 90s classic kind of electronic EDM thing, uh, rave music from back in the 90s. And it just, it's just comes in with a cut, this perfect moment. And it's just like, it's a great moment. And that's just good editing. You know, you know, the editor sat there and was like, man, we got to drop a great track. We can build all of our momentum. And that's a really wonderful thing when you can start getting out of the minutia of scene by scene editing, right? Specifically and really start pacing things for the big picture. You know, uh, Thelma Schoonmaker is just a master at this. I mean, she's a master at all things editing, but when you look at her movies, movies like Goodfellas and Casino, all these classics, scenes are so intricate, right? There are scenes that are just so detailed and intricate and personal and the nuance of, every beat and every performance is occurring. And then also just the pace of the whole movie, you know, and all the different notes that are played throughout and the way that it just masterfully works together. Like that is master editing. Um, Another really important thing to consider uh, when making films, any types of films, long or short, is to have an editor editing while you're making the movie. It is a big mistake not to. I've done it before. It is not smart you're shooting the movie, you're kind of like rolling blind. It's great to have an editor there. If they can really keep pace with production schedule, they're getting the footage. Maybe they're like a day behind and they're cutting things together and they're coming to you and going, Hey, this last scene you shot two days ago, like we're missing an insert. I need a way to get around something. Can you get a shot of the hand grabbing the salt shaker or whatever it is? You know, they can give you these live notes and you can watch this material as it's occurring. Um, as you're shooting. And, and then it also just, it saves you so much time down the road because you're coming out of your movie and then you get to go in and you start refining, especially if an editor that you trust, you can really refine the cut and get it into place quickly. So, so editing while you shoot is super key, super important. Um, 
I'm also a big proponent of pickups. I think you need to dedicate time to go back in and pick things up because editing in many ways is the rewriting of like your production process and your writing process. I don't, look, everyone who writes, rewrites. Rewriting is writing. It's how you get something good. All actors get other takes. Once in a while, it's like a one take wonder for whatever reason, maybe they nailed it or you just got to move on. You're, you're way behind schedule, but everyone gets more takes. The only person that doesn't get more takes is the director shooting many times. You're going in, you're shooting, you're editing. That's it. You have to work with what you've got. Now, the greats and, and the big budgets and all of those things, or, or even smart indie filmmakers, they get the ability to go back in and pick up a couple of things, even if it's you know two days. You, you're saying no matter what, we're going to edit this movie and I get two days back in production because you're going to edit and you're going to watch it. And I, I, I suggest that you have other people watch it as well. And you use test screen forms to answer, to ask really specific questions, get good answers back and then take that data and then take a little break, take some time away, clear your mind of it, go travel, go run a marathon, do something to get out of it and come back with fresh eyes, do some test screening, see how people are responding. I don't care how fucking smart you are, how cool you are, how talented you are, get other people's eyes on it and listen to what they have to say. And don't even be in the room when they're just remove yourself from it. Like you're behind a glass and you're a police interrogator trying to get the truth. It's that's invaluable. And then get back in there and shoot a little bit more, pick up the things that you need. You're going to need it. It's going to help your edit. Um, it's a, such a huge part of editing, I think, and making a great film is being able to go back in because you edit and then you can watch and you can do all the test screenings and watch yourself and really dial it in in so many different ways, you know? And, and then, and then the other interesting thing is like when you do that, when you watch your movie with an audience, you're going to find things, weird things are going to come up, all kinds of problems that you'll occur. Um, um, a character is not likable. Their motivation doesn't make sense. Why did they go from being this way to that way so quickly? And you'll be like, oh, well, it's because of that, this, and that. And the audience is like, we're not tracking that. That's not coming through. And you're like, oh, shoot. Okay. Wow. You know, or people are getting bored in the second act, you know, or the third act is not exciting enough. There's a million and one things that can occur. And then you got to go back in and go, hmm, well, how do we solve this? And you got to do it in the edit. And you'll be amazed what you'll find with scraps, uh, takes, little moments after people have called cut or, or right before they call action. There's all kinds of stuff that you can work with to build it in. If a character's not likable, spending more time with them on screen, potentially finding ways to build up a certain character or maybe bring down a character if someone's if you're losing the mystery around someone. I mean, there's just a million and one ways to approach. And, and, and many times you can get abstract too. You know, really think creatively um, about your edit. So I, I hope that was helpful. I just wanted to talk about editing. Um, I love editing. It takes time. Um, this wasn't really a technical analysis. This was more just like the creative approach. And there's so much more to dive into. But I'd love to know everyone else's thoughts about editing, some of the things that were discussed here, your own experiences, any other questions, please put them in the comments and we should keep talking about editing. Thanks. Have a great day.